Good afternoon. Thanks for joining us. Uh, the panel and I are very excited to have this conversation with you all this afternoon. And we do hope it is an interactive conversation. So as your questions arise, as you want to react to or clarify what we are going through up on stage, or you want to add a different viewpoint, please do send those in and we'll be happy to incorporate those. So this afternoon, the sort of topic that we were given at hand is to talk about the mega mergers. And unless you've been under a rock, you're well aware that in the insurance sector, as well as others, we're experiencing a pretty major wave of uh, merger and consolidation. And we wanted to explore what that might mean uh, at, for different consumer provider perspectives, other insurers, large self-funded employers, and most importantly, for startups, entrepreneurs, and investors. And so we will, uh, this afternoon, hopefully have some lively conversation. We have a, a highly expert panel here, obviously two CEO founders of wonderful startups, uh, as well as Janet bringing a wealth of experience from the health insurer world. Uh, myself as an academic, I feel like I have to start with sort of where does it start when you think about massive consolidation, and often the literature would say and experience that that's often not a great thing. Uh, it can lead to uh, increased leverage in prices. It can lead to uh, reduction in competition and less choice. It can also be extremely distracting, and so that's a challenge. On the plus side, it can lead to economies of scale as well as efficiency. And, and hopefully the opportunity to use new leverage as a lever for reform and innovation. And that remains to be seen what will happen. Uh, so with that, I want to ask each panelist uh, to also introduce themselves. But by way of that, kind of give you all a sense of the lens that they bring to this conversation as, they, as we talk about so what might be the impact of consolidation. And I'm going to turn it over first to Ali and let him share a little bit about collective health as well as his perspective. Thanks, Kim. Uh, I'm Ali Diab. I'm the founder and CEO of Collective Health. Uh, we provide a mechanism for employers to self-insure their health plans um, using largely software versus people, as it's traditionally done. Um, the lens that I bring to this industry and to the company um, really emanates from the origins of the company itself. Uh, I was hospitalized in early 2013 with a sudden um, and unexpected uh, life-threatening illness, which put me in the hospital for several weeks. Um, and the result of which was a mountain of bills that I came home to once I was discharged from the hospital, including um, paperwork that basically said that my insurance company wasn't going to cover a lot of my hospital and surgical costs, which came as a surprise to me. So the lens that I bring to this is very much one of a member or a consumer um, who had to actually go through the healthcare system sort of as an individual to feel what it was really like. I had you know, read about it in the press before, but never really paid much attention to it until I became sort of one of those statistics that you read about. Um, and that really informs everything that we do. I'm Noah Lang, uh, CEO and co-founder of Stride Health. And at Stride, we deliver health coverage, health care, and a full suite of benefits to independent working Americans. So uh, inherently, people who are not getting coverage from their employer, a lot of 1099s, part-timers, um, were directly embedded in one great example would be Uber's driver app. Um, people who are increasingly creating independence through pulling in uh, fractional labor on platforms need support. Um, and so my lens is very much, we have a full marketplace of plans. We have 230 carriers in 50 states now, um, and we serve up all of their plans. Um, so we have a full marketplace, and we drive comparison by creating unique recommendations based on someone's health, based on their finances. And we give uh, small and large health plans alike an opportunity to compete head to head around a person. Um, so it's my perspective is both individuals and uh, true marketplace opportunity. Janet? Hi there. I'm Janet Widman, and I'm the former uh, EVP from Blue Shield overseeing their markets division. And uh, my perspective is a little unique. I have a lot of experience in, uh, in the payer side, on the employer side, on the provider side. But for this particular conversation, I also had the opportunity to work with Ali and Noah when they were pitching their uh, digital health startups to Blue Shield. And so I hope to share that uh, perspective for you, what that was like when you're on the other side of the table, if you will, or even on the same side of the table, talking about the opportunities to work with digital health companies. Great. Thank you. So we are well aware that there's all different kinds of consolidation going on. We're going to kick it off first and just sort of focus on this mega insurer. The idea of the big five may soon become the big three uh, if everything goes through as regulatory plan. What I wanted to ask each of the panelists to kind of comment on is, do you think 
this is going to have a positive or negative impact? And as you think about it, who sort of stands out based on your lens as to who might be not so much winners or losers, but who, who's going to really feel the impact of this uh, first and foremost? And feel free to comment on more than one lens. Obviously, we've got the providers, other insurers, large self-funded employers, and most importantly, consumers, but also entrepreneurs. So wanted to give each of you a chance to kind of weigh in about where you see uh, mega mergers and sort of reduction in the number of large national carriers, where that might net out. And I think I'll, I'll start with Noah on that one. Okay, so I'll, I'll go from the consumer perspective. Great. Um, I, I think it's, it's a really interesting moment in time right now. So again, as I said, pure marketplaces right now, we can put a, a tiny carrier head to head with a with a major national carrier, and so um, you know one of the I think one of the conditions uh, that has yet to be determined is you know we're entering entering the third year post ACA. Um, we're in an interesting moment in time where small uh, small carriers. It's not easy to spin them up, right? We know how much money it takes to do that, but it's one of the easiest moments in time in which you can do it. Um, and so, does that do those major mergers threaten? Uh, the ability for a small carrier to compete. Um, I'm not sure right now that we have an answer to that question. Uh, I think generally more choice is a good thing if you have an efficient marketplace where people can make decisions on um, on real data, uh, understand how to apply it to their, their own lives. Um, and right now, I guess I would err on the side of they're not a good thing for, uh, for the end individual market not necessarily talking about small group or large enterprise, um, but the individual market, consumers, um, I think the more choice and diversity we have, the better. Um, I, I guess we, um, if we look at other industries, you look at airlines, you look at cable, where we've seen mass consolidation, you just see a, an increase in price and a decrease in quality. Uh, I'm not sure that we'll see an increase in prices yet, just because it's not quite a pure sort of supply demand mm -hmm. um, in, in healthcare. Um, but I think quality, quality does go down uh, on a larger scale. Um, you see it with airlines, uh, and you see it with carriers. Today, we work with uh, with tiny, tiny carriers like a local Chinese community health plan, uh, and we work with the major nationals. And the smaller they are, the easier they are to get a hold of, the easier they are to work with, and usually the more they focus on consumer experience. So, for me, that's that's sort of the key nugget: is can we drive a great consumer experience if we have three very large, highly commoditized uh, insurance products? Great. Janet, you want to weigh in on that? Sure. So when I, when I think about the consumer, I think about who's ultimately paying the bill. So in some cases, it may end up being the large employers or small employers or, or the individuals, as Noah was mentioning. And I tend to be a firmly rooted optimist. And so I think that if the, the plans that are involved in these mega mergers, if they use their power for good, and change the reimbursement system to a value-based reimbursement system and get away for fee-for-service, I think that would be a tremendous outcome that would make a difference for all of us. And that would be, that would be the upside of these mega mergers. And then the fact of the matter is, though, that there's no evidence that these mergers typically benefit consumers. And when you look at Anthem and Cigna getting together, they have very different marketplaces. They're largely complementary. There's a handful of states where they overlap. In the case of uh, Aetna and Humana, one of the biggest uh, MA players, Medicare Advantage players, is coming out of the marketplace. So it's hard to think about how that's a good thing for, for consumers. And then for large national employers, um, I think that's that this, uh, this moment could be pretty concerning for them because they've looked in, uh, to these five carriers to give them choice, to give them options, to give them leverage, negotiating power, whether that was to try something innovative or just to manage prices. And that's going to be a big challenge for them going from five to three. And so I think if I were a large national employer, I would be real concerned about this, uh, this moment. Yeah, actually, just to follow up on that, Aon Hewitt just put out a little release and talked about a webinar they did with some of their 100 largest clients. And when they surveyed those clients, 46% said, in fact, that they, they, they view this negatively. They're concerned about the potential negative impact. So there is some trepidation about what this is going to mean for them. And it, we, as we discussed as a panel, it may be different in different markets, depending on what you already have available or the way your state-based uh, uh, public exchange runs, whether it's active purchaser or more open. So 
some nuances there, but large employers do seem to have a set of concern. Ali, would you like to speak to that, just given the client base of collective health and your own perspective? Yeah, I mean, I would echo that. I think, you know, if you look at our customer set, which is largely self-funded employers, in many markets, you're going from having two or three options to potentially one as a carrier, as a national carrier, if you're a large organization, to administer your health plan. And you know, typically, the drastic reduction of choice, to echo what Noah and, and Janet said, is probably not a good thing, at least in terms of your ability to negotiate a price that makes sense for that service. Um, to me, more generally, when I look at industries, whether I mean, Noah mentioned the airlines, but we look at airline, the airline industry or telecom or now health insurance, sort of mature, let's call it sort of rent generating industries. When you see massive consolidation like this, it's typically because the players are sort of out of big ideas and they sort of go toward a rent-seeking type of end game where they try to maximize operating cost and efficiency. And to Janet's point, hopefully that leads you know, to better sort of cost and outcomes for individuals. But I think it remains to be seen mm -hmm. based on the history of other industries, whether that in fact is something that the end consumer ultimately gets to enjoy. You're just going back to Janet's point about will they use their power for good or something other than good? So, you know, you wanted I, that well, chime I think in. If you if you look at airlines, there's been a couple studies done on, on in the airline industry where you actually, um, if you end up with fewer choices, but there still is a, a low cost carrier in that market. So you have a large merger, and then you have a low cost carrier on some routes. Um, you do see the prices drop. Uh, post-merger because they're now competing and they're, they're trying to push out the low-cost carrier, but they're actually <laughs> trying, to, they're, they're, they're trying to, to take over those routes. And in the other markets, you actually see the prices rise. And so I think that the question is, if, is there enough of a competitive set left, maybe you, right, um, to, uh, to push them to still innovate, to push them to still um, create better products? higher quality experiences mm -hmm. and at least choice amongst the products that they have as a, as a sort of fewer number of organizations. Mm -hmm. And so based on all this, you know, there are more than just the big five becoming the big three, obviously Blue Shield. There's plenty of other strong regional and other players. As we know, we also see a variety of health systems moving into the business of being insurers as they get their own networks by acquiring physician practices, and then they take on risk-bearing contracts and get the appropriate licensure to be able to be basically an insurer. So there are other players here. Do you all have a perspective on what this means for them and where there might be uh, opportunities or sort of a window of, of, of catalyst for them to step up and, and decide how they're going to respond to this moment. Ali? Yeah, I mean, I, I think the impetus is even greater now for them to figure that out. I mean, to Janet's point, if the consolidation does drive more, let's call it risk sharing on behalf of the provider in the form of sort of value-based um, sort of payments, then they're already bearing a bunch of the mm -hmm. costs, effectively a capitated model. And so why not kind of go all the way is probably some of the calculus that these guys are considering in their brains. And I think if you just look at the San Francisco Bay Area, between, the, between UCSF, Sutter, and Stanford, I mean, you, you pretty much cover the San Francisco Bay Area. And you, can, you could credibly make the argument that if you were any one of those big systems, you could probably sell a network or a plan to at least somebody. Right, and certainly people who are geographically co-located in your area of greatest provider density. So I think that, that the consolidation that we're seeing on the payer side is, is inevitably going to, I think, lead to more options for employers and for individuals in terms of ACOs and providers offering the same. Great. Either one of you want to comment on that point? So we've got a couple questions here coming from the audience already, so I thought I would uh, check in on one. Um, Rusha asks, should insurance actually still be linked to employment in the first place? And this is, of course, um, an age-old question that we, you know, we, we circle back to on all different kinds of panels and topics of, is our model of, of largely employer-based insurance still valid? Does it make sense? And do these mergers weigh in pro or negative on that? Anybody want to tackle that for the audience? I, I would say no. Uh, I mean, we deal with a population that we know uh, more and more Americans are separating from traditional work, right? I don't want to work. It's very millennial. I don't want to work nine to five and go to the same desk every day. I still want to produce, right? I still want to be an active participant, um, but I want to build my own collection of income streams or I want to strike out on my own and be a freelancer. And that's, that's our market. And it's very, very hard to access all of the benefits that you need as an individual without an employer. Um, at the same time, you have, a, you have sort of an odd 
policy dynamic where um, if you have a platform, let's say an Uber or an Etsy or an eBay even, that's providing income to an individual, they're participants in that marketplace, today you can't give benefits to someone who's not an employee. Right. Uh, at the same time, we have a lot of political discourse lately that uh, if you're not giving benefits, well, then we should reclassify them because uh, freelancers need support. And so um, you have sort of an odd uh, dissonance in this moment in time where we're demanding that people become employees so that they can actually get benefits, but people want to work more independently. And so I think you need to unbundle them and separate the two, at least give individuals the opportunity to get their own suite of benefits. You know, this is, this is one of the things that I love about the ACA, is that it, in, it improved access for everyone as well as portability. And so if an employer wants to offer insurance because they think it will differentiate them in the marketplace or it's part of their total value rewards program or something like that, I think that's fantastic because ultimately that's, that's their competitive sustainable difference or their employees. And yet at the same time, as what, no, as, based on what you're saying, Noah, you know, folks want the flexibility. And if they can now go to exchanges, not worry about pre-existing conditions, and get uh, access to a suite of affordable products, it's a fantastic option, too. That's one of the benefits of the ACA. Mm -hmm. I mean, as someone who offers solutions to employers, I'm uh, obviously a little bit biased <laughs> in, my, in my response. <laughs> but but what, what I will say, and, and you know, facetiousness aside, what I will say is that if you look at all of the major sort of paradigm level um, disruptions that have happened in health service delivery over the last 35, 40 years, they have primarily all been driven by employers, and mm -hmm. it stands to reason because okay. employers have the purchasing power and the clout to get people to do things. If I went and tried to negotiate a deal for maternity with UCSF on my own, I probably wouldn't get anywhere, but you know, if I was Google or Facebook, I would. And so I do think that there is a place for employers. I do think employers can engender, and there's plenty of evidence to support this, good behavior among their populations because you're there all the time, and to Janet's point, it can be part of a total reward strategy that rewards you for good behavior. But I think maybe even more importantly, there's an underlying economic sort of, let's call it dislocation in the market, but it's a reality. And that is that a dollar that an employer spends on health care is more tax efficient than a dollar that you and I yeah. spend on health care. Even with HSAs, sure. I mean, they're, they're capped. And so what that basically means is that a dollar that an employer pays, notwithstanding all of the price power that they have as a group purchaser, goes further than the dollar that you and I pay on health care. So I think there is an argument, and I think it's a logical one to be made, that as long as that is the case, and I don't see the corporate tax code changing anytime soon, I'd be willing to prove wrong, I think employers will continue to play a very important part mm -hmm. in, our, in our health care system. And then as a macro guy, you know, I think if you believe in things like single payer systems, well, we kind of have one in the system and it's called the employer. And again, it's because of the tax code because from the post-war period till today, you've seen the largest transfer of, of wealth in human history from the US federal government's balance sheet to private corporations in this country's balance sheets. They've never been richer, they've never had more cash. So I think you could, even if you're a populist, make an argument that, you know what, then employers should at least shoulder most of the burden of cost, just like in a single payer system the government would in a solvent country for those people who are employed and on those people's payrolls. You know what? Do you want to react? Yeah, I, I think the question is, is, is <laughs> the like employer <laughs> is the employer shouldering that burden or is it just one part of your compensation, right? And then should should an individual not have the opportunity to take advantage of similar tax advantage um, spending opportunities, right? I know you're right. Tax code is the hardest hardest laws to uh, to rewrite, right? Um, but I, I think we've also seen the flip side of the employer uh, decision, where we, we do have some very very small businesses who don't provide coverage. Um, they can't afford to. They don't know how to. They don't want to. Uh, and a lot of them say, I don't want to pick my employee's doctor. Yeah. Right? I don't want to be a part of that. And you're trying to solve that problem as well. But you know. This, I think this question of, at least for smaller businesses, should I be a part of determining what doctor you can go to and what drugs you can take? And a lot of small business owners don't want that responsibility. Right. They didn't get into it for that. And we've got something else, other reason right. they, they, they're doing what they're doing, right. and it's not to provide insurance or get involved in that level of detail. So can you separate the tax advantages from, uh, from that yeah. decision? 
So a lot of people are asking questions about how to work with payers, the challenges currently, and how do you start conversations with payers if you want to have a business relationship with them or otherwise, and will that become more difficult, more compromised if the big five become the big three, and is part of that could be due to the distraction factor as they look at how to try to merge claim systems and network processes and all kinds of things, but part of it could just be they're big organizations as it is, and it can be difficult to crack in. So do you see anything? meaningful changing you know in how anyone tries to do business with payers um, and is it going to get worse or better or stay the same and are there any sort of advice bits about that and I don't Jen if you want to start sure I'd, I'd be happy to um, and, I, and I'd welcome you guys to comment on this so when uh, when all of the activity was going on with the initiation of the ACA and getting ready to open up the exchanges, every health plan was preoccupied. Even if you weren't in working on the exchanges, you were trying to figure out what the regs mean, all the regulations that have occurred in the industry. And yet at the same time, uh, digital health companies were starting to become part of the ecosystem. And in my experience, right in the middle of all of this, we created a partnership with, uh, with Ali's company and with Noah's company. And so one of the things that differentiated them when they came in and pitched uh, to us as a, as a health plan is they were very clear on their value proposition. And with all of these mergers going on, if, if any of you guys are in the audience or thinking about going and pitching to the plans, now more than ever, you've got to be so tight on that pitch. What is the value that you're going to create? What is your unique solution going to solve for them? And ensuring that you have a sustainable, scalable solution and can point to the value that you're going to create, that will help because uh, there, there has to be a general dampening of plans' interests as everybody's trying to figure out what will these mergers mean uh, on a national landscape as well as in their local markets. So um, these guys did that really well. I'd encourage you to spend time with them <laughs> afterwards and uh, get a copy of their pitch decks. <laughs> Anything you guys want to add to that? What did you do? What did you feel? What did you uh, feel was helpful? Well, I think I think people. Want to... I, I, I'm going to take a slightly different uh, tact on sure. answer. And I'm happy to share what what we chatted about as well. Um, I think that one of the interesting learnings for us coming out of the gate, starting from zero, is that um, actually the smaller the payer, the smaller the carrier, um, the the more ready they were to do business with you. Mm -hmm. Um, and so looking at, at uh, metro-specific carriers even, right? Um, you look at the Oscars in New York, right? Still a very small health plan. I know we talk about them a lot, but very, very small, relatively health plan. Um, those are the plans that are actually going to try to compete with the major mega carriers uh, by working with you as a, as a small technology company. And so for me, it's about starting there. Um, the one anecdote I guess I'll share is part of our engine uh, goes and looks for your practitioners um, and looks at the network size around you as an individual to see if we can get you in a high quality network where you can keep your doctor. Um, the smaller carriers would just send us practitioner data. No problem, here it is. We don't need you to sign anything, do anything, and we'll update it. How frequently do you need it updated? Um, and now is their competitive advantage because we all, I think we all know and talk about how the second you get it, uh, Doctor network data, it's old. Um, but knowing how old it is and knowing that your data is newer than everyone else's, I think for small carriers was a competitive advantage. Um, and so figure out what you can go take to those tiny carriers to start there. Um, give them a competitive advantage. They will compete against the big carriers. It's still a local market product. Um, and then you can build leverage there and then go to the larger carriers so they need to compete downstream. Okay. I think the only thing I'd add is that as industries mature, there's generally a trend towards specialization. Mm -hmm. And I think that while it is specific to the carrier, I do think most carriers recognize that they are specialists in th certain things and not phenomenally good at other things. I think Blue Shield of California came to that conclusion probably faster than most, but I think most large carriers understand that whether it's analytics or whether it's sort of UX or just kind of the consumer interface, it's probably not their strength for the most mm -hmm. part. Um, 
but what they are really good at is building and maintaining networks and contracting with providers. And so I think as long as you engage a carrier as a partner in a discussion, probably not unlike from what I've heard, I, I'm not, not privy to these conversations obviously, but probably in the same way that Apple engaged AT&T and Verizon when they were launching a device that potentially threatened you know, what, it mean, what it meant to be a cell phone company back then, I think you'll get far. But I think if you come in with a lot of bluster and you're just going to basically you know, demolish these guys and like crush their markets and stuff like that, you probably won't get very far. And I will say I am sometimes surprised at some of the bombast that I hear from even very early stage companies in this area. I mean, there's a reason why things are the way they are. I think if you do your homework, you'll discover why they are the way they are. It's not to say that you can't enter the market, but you need a very clear, to Janet's point, clear thesis and strategy in a way, in general, that is partner-driven versus kind of independent, I'm going to do it my way, the highway-driven. Mm -hmm. Janet, anything you want to add to that? You know, I, as, we're, as we're talking about this, I'm thinking about the provider dynamic mm -hmm because not all digital health is focused on payers. And the provider dynamic is so interesting here because there's been so much consolidation that's been going on for a while with hospitals picking up um, other entities, physician practices. And so when, when I think about all of this discussion around, gee, these insurance carriers are merging, what does that mean? And I hear Noah, and he's, he's absolutely right about the smaller carriers can move faster. Healthcare is local. Healthcare is absolutely local. And so uh, I don't think anyone should lose sight of there's consolidation going on in the provider industry. Pharmacy is a big part of the cost equation here. And certainly that the plans have their part to do. And, um, and where the game will change is when consumers, when patients, have enough information to truly be consumers. When patients become consumers, then the entire game changes. Then everybody will, will need to be good actors in this equation. And I think that's where digital health really makes its mark. Yeah, I think we, as a panel, we did have this conversation that obviously the insurance consolidation is not the only force going on. We've been seeing all kinds of consolidation on the physician side and the health system side. We also talked a bit about the product side with pharma and biotech and other things like you know CVS buying out Target's pharmacy and clinic business. So what impact do you think some of that also plays into this? It obviously continues to sort of have the ripple effect of distraction and change, but where do you see opportunity from that from an entrepreneur, startup, investor perspective? I, mean, I think the, for me, the provider consolidation is a mixed bag. I think you can, you can argue it both ways, right? For, for the end patient, if we're calling them the consumer, you're probably, you know, you're increasingly going to get better care because you're going to have um, probably better coordination of your care and you're going to have systems that have a higher frequency of specialty um, treatments. So they're going to get better at those, right? Collectively, you're going to have a system that might work better around patient outcomes. But on the flip side, if the practitioner is the consumer, mm -hmm. um, it's not necessarily a great place to be, right? Um, and so it's a little bit of a mixed bag there. I think that also falls into those uh, consolidated provider groups then becoming health plans, which I think on a local scale, they can compete exceptionally well with, uh, with a major national care based on both brand and quality and hopefully with consumer data outcomes. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that Again, I think the cell phone industry, I mean, I come from that world, so I know a lot about it, I think is instructive in, in this sense in that if consolidation leads to fewer actors who are motivated and willing to sort of make the entire ecosystem healthier and to grow, the, so to speak, the pie for all of them, then I think you'll see a lot of innovation and change for good, just like you saw with interoperability standards around text messaging and things like that, where in the early days of cell phone networks, because there were just so many of them, you couldn't send one text message from a person on one cell phone network to another. So similarly to kind of to Noah's point about interoperability of data and things like that, you know, I think if these guys, as they consolidate, understand that there's value for all of them to be had and sharing data more liberally, both between themselves as well as with their customers, I think we'll see a lot of good things. I think the thing I worried about, that I worry about is if these guys start to have an iron fortress mentality where it's like, okay, now that I'm this big behemoth, I get to own my data and then no one else gets to see it, I think we could see a completely different outcome. So I think it's, I mean, that's like anything, you know, intentions belie everything. So if these guys intend to share and intend to push the industry forward, I think we'll see some great stuff and we'll probably see it happen faster than it might have otherwise happened, like we did in the cell phone industry. But if not, it could be bad. 
Yeah, and on your, actually, when I was roaming through the Collective Health website, I noticed that you, were, you all had just actually recently released a little paper on this topic, and sort of you had a fairly optimistic take on it beyond sort of the straight up what might consolidation bring in terms of the downside. You had a very sort of positive message that maybe there's a big role here for digital health to really get into the conversation, really spur some of that, be a catalyst for uh, helping move some of that forward. I, I don't know if you want to add to that, um, but I think that's an interesting perspective, is what more could digital health be doing in this era of mergers to help bring things together to that more positive outcome? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's not unlike geopolitics. I mean, when you live in a unipolar world, that unipolar lead actor doesn't have a ton of incentive necessarily to play nice with others. But when you live in a multipolar world where you kind of all have to get along and you need free trade agreements in order to sell goods and services in each other's markets, you tend to sort of make things work. And I think from what we're seeing, and this is why we're optimistic, there, yes, is a consolidation happening in, in, in the industry, but it seems like there's a consolidation of countervailing and counterbalancing powers, whether it's health benefit consultants on one end, or pharmacy benefit managers on another, or providers and ACOs on another, or the payers or large insurers on another. And I think we hope, and we're optimistic about it, that they will kind of keep each other honest to a certain degree and use their market power to keep each other honest. But again, that's a, that's a hope. Um, and we'll see if it actually ends up being reality. You have to be an optimist to start a company, right? Absolutely. You definitely do. <laughs> <laughs> Especially in healthcare. Exactly. I didn't know, Jen, if you had anything you wanted to add. You, you know, I was thinking about um, where the opportunity is for digital health companies based on what, what Ollie was just saying. And so um, there's, there's the piece that I think, Noah, you mentioned around speed. Those guys are going to be preoccupied. The biggies are going to be preoccupied with integrations and synergies and all of those things. And so the, the local and the regional plans um, hopefully will take advantage of that distraction to giddy up and look for places where they can differentiate in terms of their value proposition to execute on their strategy. But there's, a, there's this other piece related to efficiencies and administrative costs and uh, their ability to make investments in major developments. And they just won't be able to compete with those big mega merged insurance companies. And that's another place where I think the digital health companies that are very clear on the problem they're solving, the technology so uh, solution that gets in there, and the value proposition can go in and work with those local plans and those regional plans and accelerate their efforts. Great. So we've got a couple questions from the audience that I want to make sure that we get to. One is specifically for Noah. Eric asks, is Stride in a position to group their customers in regional locations to bring bundled purchase power to certain carriers? Maybe. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think it, um, yeah, I mean, we, we have a population that's building in a pretty unique way, right? Traditionally, individuals and the individual market is it's pretty uninteresting to just about everyone here. Uh, it's really go hard to go acquire consumers. Um, you have to go um, sort of uh, figure out who they are and where they are, but we've figured out ways to actually collect a population of them um, based on sort of where they work and how they work. Um, and so I think there is an interesting opportunity um, if we look at particularly the way our customers contribute data about their health and about they want, what they want out of their health plan and what their financial risk profile is. Uh, we can't, of course, price their health plans uniquely post ACA, right? Even though a lot of them are very healthy. Um, but we can bring them, I think, new product experiences um, uh, and, and we talk about unbundling benefits from employment. I think that there's a, there's a dream state of unbundling um, the traditional coverage product. Uh, a lot of our customers don't want uh, pre-diabetes counseling. They want more nutrition programs. Um, so can you create new products around new audiences in the individual market that don't, um, uh, that don't undermine sort of the, uh, the individual market risk profile, mm -hmm. um, but do deliver new products out there in a more targeted way. But Interesting. Yeah. And this is, where, this is where I think the employer-sponsored market can shed some light on what can be done once you have the flexibility to do that. I mean, mm -hmm. when you're an employer, you can basically, and you're self-funded, you can basically design a plan pretty much the way that you want. And hopefully, Hopefully, the sort of smaller group and, and individual market will learn from that and hopefully adapt their products. 
because that's really important, right? What you could read in all this consolidation and this push to standardize and centralize certain things and the goal of achieving efficiency is that it's going to get a lot less interesting and a lot less of that personalized, customized, which is sort of the opposite way of where we all would like to see things as consumers often. We want to feel like the product we're buying or the service that we're getting is what we want and what we need. And so you've got this tension between what might be happening with more consolidation and that drive to achieve those efficiencies versus the desire. And so you know, what to do about managing that and, and, and where will that go? Any thoughts? I, I would argue it's not even just a tension. I think, I mean, Janet can speak to this, but I think it's actually a technical constraint. I mean, we've had a look at most of the sort of large claim systems that these carriers use, and they're, they're pretty brittle systems. And so adapting or morphing them to support more modern plan designs, or I would even argue dynamic plan designs, which is really what we should move toward, is virtually an impossibility. There's just so much technical debt. And I think people forget that these national carriers, yeah, they're national now, but they're all amalgamations of regional carriers that have basically been Frankenstein together right. over the last 35 years, and they <laughs> each have like four or five different claim systems apiece. And so getting them even internally to be able to communicate or interoperate is a big challenge, let alone with the outside world to be able to support some of the things that you know, Noah is suggesting, which I think are right, they should support. That was such a lovely word to use, brittle. That was so, <laughs> so kind. You know, I... I just had this, um, this anecdote I want to share, and uh, someone who, who's leading a digital health company called me recently and said, well, I've got this question. I was talking with this huge insurance company, and they said they don't have the email addresses for the vast majority of their members. Is that true? Said, yeah, sounds right. <laughs> um, and they said, well, you know, they said it was because of regulations, that they can't have it. And I said, well, my experience is they typically, the systems are so brittle and they're so Frankenstein. Um, two things usually happen. There isn't a field to collect the email address and the process hasn't been re-engineered to get it when you need it. And so when you think about the opportunity for other companies, digital health companies, to come in and have something that can really propel those plans, because it's so hard to make those sorts of changes, let alone be as agile and nimble as what these guys have done, it's really an extraordinary opportunity for digital health. So a, me, a couple of national carriers, maybe, maybe those that are emerging, have uh, specifically said that 20% of the time they have the email address. Yeah, that, that they don't. Sounds, yeah, they don't. They do not have the email yeah. addresses. Yeah. They often don't know who's in their network at any given time, nor do the people in the network know what network they're in. So it is, a, it is fraught with challenge. Do you see, though, other business opportunities coming with that? You know, you're, like you're just identifying some sort of analytics or other way to, you know, lit, sit on top of these brittle systems. Are there other opportunities there that should be explored in the digital health and analytics community to support this? I mean, they already are. I mean, companies like Verisk and Truven exist for mm -hmm. a reason. Um, companies like Strenus exist for a reason. I mean, there are a lot of people who are supporting that brittleness, but I think it's more of a Band-Aid than you know, actual reconstructive surgery, which is, I think, what these systems need. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know, I mean, uh, I could be wrong, but I think it's difficult to expect the incumbents to go through and to sort of shoulder that technical debt and the burden that comes with that to do it. I do think you're going to need an outside player to do it, much in the same way that you know, in the retail space, you needed somebody like Amazon to come in and mm -hmm. shake things up because the brick and mortar guys were just not willing to do it. There wasn't as much of an incentive. It's the classic sort of innovator's dilemma. Mm -hmm. It's a little more kick from the outside. You know, I'd actually offer that in addition to that, it's the alignment of incentives. So coming back to the, the health plans not having data on the networks, well, there's, there's, two, there's two people that need to dance there. The providers need to be able to have an easy way to update their information and ideally not have to do it for all of the carriers that they contract with. And so what's the incentive for both parties to, to do that and do it well for the consumer? Because that's who ultimately needs that information and counts on it to be right. So I've got another question here. This is from Charles. He asks, how do the speakers see the impact of the implementation of the Cadillac tax in 2017 disrupting markets further? And what opportunities do they see during this offering um, for digital health startups? 
I mean, I, I can jump in. It, it impacts self-funded employers probably more mm -hmm. than anyone. Huge. People estimate that one in four employers are going to have to pay some kind of penalty. And for those of you who don't know what the Cadillac tax is, it's basically an excise tax, which means just a plain tax um, of 40 percent on excess amount that's paid above a certain level for employee health care coverage. Um, and I think, you know, I think the spirit of what the Cadillac tax represents was a good one. Um, I think its implementation, like a lot of things in government, was not sort of fully thought through. Um, one of the things that's an artifact of the Cadillac tax is that it's uniform across the country, but as Janet and Noah just alluded to, healthcare is highly local, including the pricing of healthcare. A unique, you know, an ACL replacement in San Francisco costs four times what it costs in Topeka, Kansas, so it doesn't make a lot of sense for that threshold to be a fixed dollar threshold like it is nationwide. So I know that, you know, Hillary Clinton has been talking about mm -hmm. repealing the tax or changing it significantly, and other candidates have as well. I would personally be surprised if it remained at least the way it is. I think it'll either be ameliorated in certain ways to give people either more time to sort of adapt their benefits and not sort of get hit with a tax immediately, since the windfall is expected to only be $80 billion roughly, um, which is actually not going to make a huge dent in our deficit. Um, but I do think there's even an opportunity for it to be repealed altogether and to be replaced with something else. Any other? I, I think that to the degree there's any sort of adjustment to the Cadillac tax that will come very late in the game. And so what's the impact to digital health and to payers? It's going to be a lot of what happened with the individual and the small group marketplaces when changes came in at the last minute. It creates a lot of chaos and it can stall things out for a period of time to address the, the matter at hand. And I think that's an actually interesting recurring theme we've had during this panel discussion, which is if you're going to be in healthcare, you're going to be dealing with a constantly changing environment, some really major sort of policy level change like the ACA, some more market driven like mergers and consolidation. So if you're going to be successful and be optimistic and get up every morning and be excited to do what you do, you know, are there tips that you would have for others in the audience who are either in it or thinking of getting into it? You know, how do you survive and thrive in what's basically a fairly volatile environment and and it can be exciting but you also have these mega mergers and mega policy changes we're having an election year coming Hillary and others have all kinds of ideas about reforming everything from can we negotiate drug prices to the Cadillac tax and that's just going to keep unfolding adding to both uncertainty and hopefully to opportunity so maybe as a closing comment from each of you sort of where, where, where what advice would you give what's your perspective on that I guess I would, I would say this goes against the grain of typical startup advice but be patient uh, I think it's a balance of impatience of, of wanting to drive change, but also being patient with how long it's going to take you to get there. This goes back to my analogy of start with the little guys. They'll, they'll get going faster and, and be patient with the bigger ones. And, uh, you know, be conscious of things like uh, the coming uh, Cadillac tax or changes like that, but don't build your entire business around that outcome because we don't know what it is. So you have to understand the system, understand the structure, uh, and be patient with it, but, um, but build what you're, you know, build the thing that you're building. <laughs> Great. Ali, any? Yeah, I, I would say just do your homework. I mean, it, it's kind of along the lines of what Noah's saying. When we got into doing what we're doing, we spent almost six months just reading before we decided what to do. Um, I don't think healthcare is one of those things, you know, unlike consumer tech, where you can just come up with an idea and then sort of on a lark jump into it. I think there are a lot of things that you need to consider, including regulatory shifts and other market shifts. Um, that being said, like with any change or with any volatility comes opportunity, and I think it actually favors the nimble, so it should favor startups. So if you're quick on your feet and you're able to identify dislocations in the market or gaps in the market that need to be filled, I can't actually think of a better time, at least in the healthcare industry, for a startup to get started because there is just going to be tumultuous and I would say massive change that's going to happen over the next 20 years and some massive companies are going to go away and some massive companies are going to get created just like happened when the internet came out or cell phones came out or the iPhone came out. So I think it's actually a really exciting time and I would encourage even more people to get into it because I do think there is just a lot of opportunity out there. Janet? Uh, this is just, this is such an extraordinary time in healthcare, and it's just the start. 
And so if, you're, if, this is, if this is where you're at and if you're thinking of leading a digital health company or you already do, uh, three pieces of advice. The first is take the long-term view. Uh, you are working in a complicated industry and you're going to make it better and it won't happen overnight, but it'll happen. So take the long-term view. The second is to get, uh, build your networks and get advice. It is complicated. Ali's absolutely right about how you approach it. Your intentions matter. Um, and, and learning and building that network. Ask questions to figure out how to maximize your opportunities. That would be the second piece. And the last is to um, stay focused. Stay focused, stay disciplined. And good luck. I think that's a great point to end on. So I want you to all uh, join me in thanking the panelists. And we thank you for your questions and your time. Thanks.